you'll be good. All right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. You can ask questions down below this video and uh, I will pick from those to answer next week. Uh, I've got um, good questions from this, uh, from this past uh, week's video. Uh, this week turned out really crazy. I had plans for things to do here and then at the last minute I had the opportunity to go down to Athens, Georgia and uh, visit with Dr. Durr. And I shot two videos with him. The first one, the audio is kind of <laughs> about 10 minutes of the first 10 minutes of the video are bad audio. Uh, I didn't, I, I, you know, I had somebody helping me film um, for a little while and uh, back by myself down there and I, I made a mistake with the, uh, with the, with the dual mic system uh, that I have for doing those uh, interviews. So about the first 10 minutes is garbage, but I think the video will be worth putting up. Um, it gets better, the sound gets better later in the video, and it's free, it's Dr. Durr, who's you know the king of horticulture <laughs> in my in in my mind and many many other people's minds uh, in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. So uh, those uh, those two videos will go up, and then out of the blue, um, I had the opportunity while I was down there, I just sent. Dr. Armitage a note saying that I was in the area and then he sent me a photo of this garden and said, do you want to film in this garden? And I was like, sure. It was a beautiful, beautiful photo and uh, ended up doing a tour video with him in a garden that you guys just are not going to believe. And I don't have enough footage from it. I mean, I was only, I needed to leave by noon on Friday. And so I only had about two hours to shoot in this garden. <laughs> so uh, what you're going to see is an abbreviated tour of that garden. The, uh, luckily the, uh, the person who, uh, the owner of the garden, who you guys will meet in the video, and she's lovely. Uh, uh, you, you guys will like her a lot. She has a lot of energy. Uh, it would take a lot of energy to make this garden. Uh, she watches the channel, and so we're going to get an opportunity to go back down there and do a more detailed tour. So don't be frustrated by that tour. If it's, it's beautiful, you'll find it incredibly beautiful, but you'll find it less... Um, uh, I don't go through the individual plants. I just didn't have time. Uh, so you're just going to see the overall scope of this place. And then I'll go back and do, um, very soon, actually, I'm going to go back and uh, do a more detailed tour of this, of this beautiful garden. Anyway, that's enough. Uh, let's get to some questions from last week. Oh, one, one quick thing. Make sure you guys are following me over on Instagram. I always forget to connect these things. I, the HortTube is on Facebook. I don't really use Facebook. I just pay... I, I just put links to things on YouTube on Facebook. Uh, but on Instagram, I do put up daily photos. So there's like, you know, a photo when I was with Durr the other day. And, uh, but currently I have a, a competition amongst the last of the dahlias that I had over here um, by the vegetable garden. Um, I had 16 dahlias a week ago. They're, go they're gone now with the fr with fr recent frost, but I had the last 16 dahlias I'm putting in a competition and just letting people pick what they think is the most beautiful dahlia that I had at the end of the season. Fun little thing, uh, but that's over on Instagram at HortTube. Okay, let's go. Uh, somebody asked me if I have any experience using tree tubes uh, for seedling uh, trees. These are just little plastic tubes that go over the bottom, or corrugated plastic tubes that go over the bottom, around the bottom of a tree. You'll see them pretty frequently. Uh, landscapers will use them and um, I don't. I, I didn't grow trees uh, in my nursery. I grew some trees. Um, I, I would buy and bare root trees and just root them out. But for the most part, the growing that I was doing was perennials and shrubs. Uh, letting other people produce my trees, I just finished them. So, uh, but I see that most of the nursery growers use them, especially up in the mountains. Um, there's several benefits of having those tubes on the bottom of them while the trees are young. Deer can't rub them. Uh, rabbits, beavers, you know, beavers can't, um, you know, come and, come and snap your tree off. And then of course there's the sun, um, issue in the, when it's really cold in the winter time, if the bottom of the tree is frozen and there's any moisture in it whatsoever, when the sun hits it in the morning, it has the potential to crack, put cracks near the bottom of the tree. So there's a lot of benefits to them. And I, I see the nurserymen using them. So I'm assuming that they that they work well for all of those, uh, purposes. Okay get lots of questions about all the containers that are in this uh, landscape. If you watch the conifer video that I put up earlier this past week, there's lots of containers throughout this uh, landscape. Almost all of them came from Michael Carr Designs and I have a, a video on the channel from, from him. Uh, if you want to find where, his, where he sells his containers, he has a, uh, uh, on his website, uh, on his website, uh, Michael Carr Designs, uh, he has a uh, product locator thing on there, so you just put in your uh, 
your uh, uh, zip code and it'll tell you the, the closest places to buy his containers. Okay, easy for me to say this morning. Um, I was supposed to shoot this video yesterday afternoon and I walk out and there's a, we've got several rentals back here, uh, NC State students in them and they're, and they're fine, but they had a live band over here. It was supposed to start at four. They had actually handed out flyers. It started at 1.30. So I had my entire day planned around shooting this video. I walk out, sit down, and the music started playing. <laughs> so I am actually doing this on Sunday morning. <clears throat> and my voice isn't up for it. Uh, let's see. Uh, somebody asked me timeline for cutting peonies down uh, in the fall. Uh, just I, I wait until they've kind of faded back. Mine typically in the summertime here in 7B in Raleigh, mine are just knocked back and gone. Typically this year, they, boy, they lingered and I, I still see them in the landscape right now. They've really lingered quite a bit longer. I don't know it's because if we were just not as hot or whatever, but typically they kind of take care of themselves. And once they're brown and all the foliage has died back, you can cut them at that time. Okay. Um, somebody asked if it's possible to extend um, a plant into a hotter zone than they're in. It kind of fits um, with another question I got, so I'll kind of put them together. Another person asked if they can grow a Styrex in zone eight in Texas, okay? Um, so, okay. So if you're, let's say a plant is rated for zone five to eight and you're in zone nine and you want to grow that plant, um, typically uh, these are heat related uh, issues and so uh, if the person for the person with the Styrex, um, Styrex grows in zone five to eight, but probably five, six, and seven uh, in the east and north. And then once you get to zone eight, we're probably talking about the Pacific Northwest. That, that's a we that's a weird thing because zone eight in Texas is just a very different uh, place. So if you're not seeing Styrex in your area, it probably um, the heat is probably just too much for them. This is from that conifer video. If you look through those conifers and you go, all the ones that were five to eight, and there's lots of conifers that are listed for five to eight, typically just don't do well here in the Southeast. Uh, those are ones that grow in the North and in the Pacific Northwest where it doesn't get super hot. The ones that are listed for five to nine typically do really well here in zone seven. Um, I, I've got some of both. The ones that are just barely marginally hardy in the heat, um, I have in a little more shade. So I had the blue spruce, which is only up to zone eight. Uh, it's getting some direct sun because it needs some direct sun over here, but it's in part shade. Um, uh, I would call it a part shade space. And so that's how I'm treating that. So yeah, you can push it a little bit, um, you know, outside of the zone. Some plants have, just to complicate this more, some plants have cold requirements. And so they don't grow in your area just simply because your winters don't get cold enough for that plant to reset itself in the wintertime. Blueberries are a great example of that. Blueberries need a certain amount of cold chill hours, we call them, in the wintertime before they come back out. So you'll see some plants if they don't get enough cold. Then other plants are listed that way, like the conifers, because it's just too hot uh, in the summertime uh, in those warmer climates. And, and again, you can get away with that a little bit by putting them in part shade, keeping their roots covered, um, that kind of thing. You might even be, be able to bring them up on a porch if you had them in a container when it's you know, 105 or something like that. But <laughs> I think I probably have really, really overcomplicated that. But uh, you know, we put so much emphasis on plants for cold. Everything's about cold. How cold can a plant take? And then this question turns around and asks, well, how much heat can a plant take? And there's, like I say, there's two reasons. Again, some, some of them need chill hours that your area just doesn't give them. Um, and that's gonna be most deciduous plants. Something like a red bud that's only listed from five to nine. Uh, if you tried to put it in zone 10, it's just simply not going to uh, get enough chill hours in the winter time. Um, it's a, like a clock the tree put itself on to make sure it didn't get fooled by an early spring. Um, and you just never put any cold on it whatsoever. So it kind of stays in that, uh, you know, in that clock. And it, you, you'll see plants decline, get smaller uh, when they have that kind of, they don't have that winter. They don't have those chill hours. Um, I've probably just said way too much about this question. If you're in the Southeast United States, which a lot of the people at, uh, watching me uh, are, um, if you're looking at conifers, you probably want conifers that are one zone hardier than your area. 
that's typically, if you can find that, that's typically ones that will grow in your area. The ones that are, are listed exactly for your area, like you're in zone eight and it's listed for five to eight, typically they're talking about the Northwest where it just doesn't, they get that same winter zone eight temperature, but in the summer they don't get 105. They get, you know, they did this past summer, um, but, but normally, normally they don't. Okay, I've probably overcomplicated that. Uh, um, somebody asked me, they noticed chamber bitter growing in my uh, vegetable garden over there in some little uh, uh, thing. If you've got loose soil with a lot of compost, you're gonna get chamber bitter, but I just take my shuffle hoe and, and I can quickly, that's one, a weed that I can quickly get rid of over there. You don't see the chamber bitter. You'll see lots of other weeds, but in mulched areas, um, in the landscape, I don't ever see it, but any area that you're turning over frequently or adding compost to frequently, uh, it's a terrible weed in the nursery business. It's just, oh, uh, it just goes absolutely crazy in nursery pots, any kind of loose, super loose soil. But to me, it's just not that big of a deal. I mean, most of those weeds that come up in the garden, the garden, so, the soil's so loose over there that the shuffle hoe just, you know, in, in five minutes, I can eliminate, you know, uh, most weeds uh, in the vegetable garden. There were several questions about late flowering camellias, ones that are budded but haven't opened up yet. The, all the camellia varieties bloom at different, um, at different times. I've got that crimson and clover I have in my front yard and my um, uh, fall blooming camellia japonica over here. They were blooming in September and uh, by the end of September. And I've got a couple like my uh, October Magic Ruby literally this week, it started to uh, open some flowers. So they all have different timings. So keep that in mind. The other thing is, any time a question starts with, I planted something this year and it's doing this, this, or this. Well, that's a lot, could have a lot to do with you planted it this year. So you put it under some sort of stress. It's adapting to the space that it's in. It's not going to be the best it's ever going to be. So don't stress about, don't stress over newly planted plants. Um, only, uh, unless they're actually in decline. But if the plant looks good, no reason to stress about it. Okay. What are my thoughts on no-till or no-turn gardening? I think that's pretty much what I do here. Um, the only time I've got that little electric tiller and I've shown it a few times, I've only tilled two times in this yard since I've been here. The first time for the vegetable garden over there because it was a lot of clay over there and I just wanted to get some of that compost down into it. Okay, so I only tilled one time over there. Since then, I've just put compost on the top uh, and, and then replanted, okay? And then this turf, this zoysia grass that went in, um, had the same thing. This was just a big clay spot. And so I wanted to till some of that organic material down into it. So I used that uh, soil cube compost, any kind of compost, it doesn't matter. Um, worked that in and then, and then smoothed it out, compact, recompacted it a bit and sodded this. So that's only two times I've used a tiller in the two years um, that I have now been uh, working on this project. Everything else, Compost went down, and then I put down some. Then I put down some wood chips. I had to get some early weeds under control. There was some liriope back here. There was some ivy back here. There was some mondo grass back here. There was some things that needed to go, and so I buried them in those wood chips um, and that compost initially. And that's it. I mean, everything else has been. I can dig in the soil now. You guys will be amazed. I mean, when you see me planting next year. Uh, or even when I was putting these pansies in, if you saw that, this soil is completely different in two years. It is amazing how much you can top down uh, change the soil uh, by, by covering it uh, with organic material. But uh, that is my philosophy as well, is not to till the soil. Tilling is killing. I should make that t-shirt, tilling is killing. Every single time you turn the soil over with a tiller, you are killing things uh, that are in that soil that are likely beneficial to the plants. But again, there are times um, if you're trying to wake it up initially, you know, I, I was dealing with two spots that I thought weren't, they didn't have a lot of life in them to start with. So I was just trying to bring them to life. And once I brought them to life, now I won't, you know, I'm not going to go back down there and kill that life again. But tilling is killing. Okay. Um, somebody asked me if you can tip prune a, Car uh, Arizona, a Carolina Sapphire, uh, Arizona Cypress. I have that one in the container in the front yard. You can see in that conifer video from this past week to encourage the bottom to fill out. Yeah, you can shear the sides, but I'd be careful tip pruning the uh, leader off of it. Uh, you don't want a bunch of leaders on that plant because uh, especially here in the Southeast, if you're using those things in the Southeast, uh, 
snow is probably okay on those things, but ice, if you had multiple liters and we can potentially get a big ice storm here, you know, ice can take those three liters or two liters and just spread them completely apart. Um, so you want one liter if you can. Uh, it's not always possible. A lot of plants got pruned so much in the nursery that they got lots of liters. But if you only have, if you only have one liter at this time, I wouldn't, I wouldn't cut it off. Just shear the sides a bit. Shearing the sides a bit will allow the sun angle to get in there a little bit better and fill them out. Again, tons of questions on this channel right now about conifers thinning from the inside. And this particular fall has been dry in the southeast. So conifers always thin this time of year and combine that with it's a little dry. Um, I see the pines are just going to, the pines are going to lose half their needles. I can see it all over the place. Uh, so, but it's normal. It's normal for the fall. And falls tend to be our driest time of the year. Okay, um, somebody uh, had a black walnut cut down and the roots are still there and they're still worried about planting uh, around it. As that stuff composts, from my understanding, you know, as black walnut, any parts of a black walnut tree are, you know, um, you know ha have the issue of being able to, po trying to poison things around them. Uh, as that stuff breaks down and compost, that effects of it are less and less and less. In the meantime, you probably wouldn't want to put things around those roots that were super sensitive to it. And you can look up that list. It's most, uh, the, I think the most sensitive things to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to black walnut and the other plants that, um, that, 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 uh, that do that are um, uh, all tomato plants, pepper plants, uh, solanaceae. All, a lot of the uh, summer vegetable plants uh, are, are, are super sensitive to it. Most plants aren't that sensitive to it, and we, and we kind of, you know, uh, overdo, you know, the effects of this, you know, the you know, black walnuts on our uh, other plants. But again, as it breaks down, and it won't take but a couple years, as that stuff breaks down, uh, the effects of it go away. Uh, as it compost, they wanted to know if they could add compost to um, help it, you know, move that along. And yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so, okay. And there was, I had an arborvitae with browning needles um, question. So I just answered that a minute ago. Normal. Um, somebody has an old camellia and it's got little suckers coming up from the roots. Wanted to know whether to get rid of them. Yeah. Um, quick and easy. Just uh, cut, cut them off. Uh, any kind of suckering plant that you don't want it suckering. Uh, and then winter is a good time to do that, to be able to see under our plants. And, you know, if there's, you know, any plant that's, you know, kind of colonizing and you don't want it to colonize as much, uh, it's super easy uh, in the winter time and much easier on us in the cold than the, than the hot to get up under them and, and, and clean them out. So if you've got anything, forsythia, uh, quince, you know, anything, any of the, you know, kind of plants that just kind of want to sucker all over the place, uh, clean them up, trees, anything. Uh, let's see. Oh boy, I had a question. It was just kind of a long question, and I just um, I'm not necessarily answering their question as much as I am. Just um, uh, I get concerned when when it's a super long list of things that they want to do to their soil. This person's talking about using pine bark soil conditioner and construction sand and uh, all kinds of things to improve their soil because somebody told them their soil is bad. And I want to go back to what I said a minute ago. All I did here was put compost on the soil to cover it up. And then I put wood chips on it and let those wood chips break down a while. You can skip the wood chip part and just put compost and then put mulch, whatever mulch you want to use. When you pull the mulch back to plant, the compost gets mixed in a little bit. It's not a whole lot of compost, but it, everything it's, I'm just improving the soil from the top down. I doubt most of you watching this channel have soil that's so bad. Um, that that basic technique of just getting the ground covered and bringing it back to life uh, won't help. Be careful adding construction sand to things like clay. Um, uh, you can change. Uh, you can change how the water moves through that soil. You can create an additional horizon. We call the layers of soil. You know, when you dig a hole uh, in the soil, you can see how you might have a clay layer and then a kind of a sandy layer and then a loamy layer. Loam tends to be near the top. That's part with the organic material in it, the darker color. Um, it has where the roots have been for your plants and that kind of thing. Uh, though, if you start adding horizons um, in your soil, um, you can really, you could probably cause yourself problems. So just keep that in mind. Um, simpler is better. Uh, a little bit of compost. You, I've talked about pine bark soil conditioner many, many times on this channel. I don't talk about it as much because a lot of people can't find it. 
um, here in the southeast. It's you know it's pine trees. We cut them down and build houses out of them, um, and so there's a lot of pine bark available. But if you can't find it, it doesn't matter. Compost is just as you know com compost and keep the ground covered. Uh, real simple, uh, how to improve the soil, use organic fertilizers um, so you're not killing the things in the soil, don't till it like I said earlier. Real simple formula uh, for improving whatever condi soil conditions uh, that you have without, um, you know, without dumping tons of n new materials on them that could have negative consequences that we can't for even foresee what the negative consequences will be. Okay, somebody asked me um, if I like Taylor's Juniper um, and then versus Italian Cypress in zone 7B. Yeah, Taylor's Juniper is probably a better choice. I see lots of Italian Cypress in zone 7 here where I'm at and in zone 8 in my travels down to Athens, Georgia, this garden that I just talked about that's so beautiful that you guys are going to see this next week. Beautiful Italian Cypress uh, in, that, in that garden. Uh, they are thin. They're not, they're not as happy as they are out west. Uh, for sure. Taylor's juniper is a better choice. Uh, it's not quite as narrow, but it is super narrow. Um, it's, a good, it's, a, it's a very good plant, probably a little bit underused and undervalued when people are all constantly asking me about tall, narrow plants. Taylor's juniper should be near that. Get so many questions about um, what's a good foundation plant, what's a good foundation plant, what's a good screening plant. Uh, keep in mind, guys, I do have the videos on the channel in playlist. And if you'll go to my main channel page for HortTube, uh, if you're watching a video on YouTube and you can just hit the HortTube um, uh, thing below the video, uh, just where it says HortTube with Jim Putnam, and it'll take you to my main channel page. And on my main channel page, you can go to playlist. And there are playlists for foundation plants, for screening plants, for uh, plants for pollinators, uh, perennials, flowering annuals, bulbs. All my bulb videos are in a bulb playlist, um, uh, so on and so forth. All these question and answer videos are in playlists. And so if you want ideas for, um, for uh, and another way to go about it, Google likes my videos for some reason. You can Google foundation plants for zone seven for the sun. And then when you click on any of those, it, you know, whoever's answered them, uh, my videos are likely to come up to the top on, on going from that angle as well because they rank pretty well um, for whatever reason uh, for my individual plant videos. So that's one way to, you know, to go about, um, you know, answering that question, uh, hopefully. Uh, and let's see, uh, somebody, uh, somebody asked where, okay, last question for this week. Somebody asked where can I buy affordable uh, planting containers, meaning the black plastic containers that nurserymen use. They are quite expensive at Lowe's and Home Depot. I mean, it's really kind of, kind of, kind of wild how much they uh, actually want to charge for them. There should be a farm supply place in your area that um, uh, sells, will sell to pretty much anybody who walks in. And I'm not talking about a chain store, farm store. I'm talking about a, you know, an, you know, a local farm store. Uh, most of them will tend to have nursery pots and some nursery supplies. Uh, Core Farm Supply in Smithfield, North Carolina, is where I got a lot of my stuff from when I was uh, when I was uh, a nurseryman in landscaping. I didn't buy my bulk pots from them. I could buy a tractor trailer load directly from you know from the manufacturer when I had my nursery. But if you're looking for a few bands, you know, where a hundred one gallon pots, a hundred three gallon pots, or whatever, that would be a farm store like that should be a place where you can find them, and they'll be quite a bit more reasonable than a retail. I just I have no idea. You buy those pots for you know, the one gal trade one gallon pots are probably nine or 10 cents, you know, bought in bulk and they're selling them for a dollar or something. I was like, whoa, that's, that seems like a, a heck of a markup. But um, yeah, farm store. Thank you guys for following along with these, um, uh, with these question and answer videos. Ask questions down below. Hope I didn't confuse people with my uh, um, heat zone uh, thing. But, you know, again, the, an the answer to that is most of the time, no, you can't move plants further south, either because they need cold or because they can't tolerate that kind of heat. Thanks for watching.